Good morning. Welcome to the Ontario Crop Research Station here in Simcoe. My name is Jason DeVoe. I'm the Application Technology Specialist with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, which is a heck of a mouthful and why I tend to just go by Spray Guy. And we're here today to do a kind of live, more film live before our studio audience, uh, adjustment of an air blast sprayer to show you the importance of matching your sprayer settings to the environment you're in and the canopy you're spraying and the product you're trying to apply. Yeah, thanks Jason. I'm Drew Thompson with uh, Adama Canada. I cover uh, most of Ontario and, and really excited. I've got a background, uh, you know, predominantly more in, in field crops. So to me, this, this, is, this is new and novel. I've done a lot of calibrations with a field sprayer. You figure out your speed, you figure out your pressure, you figure out the, the volume coming out. But, but this really isn't what we're doing here today, is it? No, not even close. So I think it's important to to recognize that a lot of the spray advice that perhaps you've encountered in horticulture originated with field sprayers spraying herbicides. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for that, but they tend to lean towards coarser droplets. Drift is a huge concern uh, with water rates and travel speeds. That makes sense for that particular commodity in that particular situation, but it's a whole other game in three-dimensional crops. Now, I'm remiss in not introducing Don Murdoch, who knows more than both of us put together. He does all the spraying for the station and has graciously agreed not to hit any trees with the tractor here today. So we're gonna focus on three points. And I did mention this is kind of live. We'd love to have you all here, but the situation doesn't allow that. So we're gonna focus on three points that I need you to take away from this. One, this is not a herbicide application in a field. So throw away any preconceived notions about coarse droplets and drift and air. We're going to rebuild all of that for you. Two, air is probably the most important part of air blast spraying. And there are a lot of good reasons for that, and we will get into them. But for now, understand that without air to carry spray to the target, to open that target, and to create turbulence to deposit the spray within that target, it's not going anywhere. And lastly, everything that we do here shouldn't be guesswork. As the sprayer operator, your job is to drive until the tank's empty. I understand. You're occupied with the occasional shoulder check and not hitting any of the targets or the trees. I get that. But we need better than that. We need a form of feedback, some way to confirm that the spray is going where you want it to go, the way you want it to get there. And shoulder checks and guesswork, those aren't the greatest way to go. So let's end this uh, little intro with one last fact, and that is, yes, we're in an apple orchard. So anyone here that grows berries or grapes or any vine crop who thinks this is not relevant to you, stay tuned. This works with any air blast sprayer. This works with any three-dimensional horticultural row crop. So let's get rolling. So Jason, the, the station looks beautiful. It's, it's a large facility. Yeah. I don't know how many acres it is, but my guess is it must be in that 75 to 100. It is big. And, and here we are in this one particular corner. Why are we here? Why did we choose this spot versus any other of, of the, the, the station or the footprint? Well, we are lucky we have so many wonderful crops at the station we could have worked with, but we kind of loaded the deck a little bit for this demo. Yeah, I don't think you can see it on the camera, but we have a big beautiful cedar hedgerow that's going to stop us from getting unexpected wind. Um, we were worried about rain today. That's not a problem unless you count me sweating here. We're going to go up to about 40 degrees today, uh, which really isn't a problem. The humidity is uncomfortable, but for what we're about to do, it's not really going to affect anything. I should explain, whenever I do one of these setups, and this isn't technically a calibration, to my mind, calibration is more of a maintenance issue. Confirming the sprayer is going as fast as you think it is. Confirming that the pressure is what you think it is. Ensuring each nozzle is working as the manufacturer anticipated or wants it to work. It's all very important and critical, but it's not what we're doing here today. Today is just adjustment and setup. So whenever someone calls me out to do this, I want to pick a spot that's representative of their, of their growth. Right. And these high density orchards are, are very popular in Ontario. We could have been, as I said, in grape, we could have been in hops. But this is fairly indicative of, of everything we want to show here today. Right. Also, it's just three rows. This is a research station. This is atypical. So depending which way the wind was blowing, we could have been positioned on either side. So as I said, we're kind of loading the deck a bit. Right. But when I do this, any adjustment to a sprayer is iterative. That means you make a change, you see what you did, and you decide whether you like it or you don't like it. And you can't do any of that without sort of a base or a foundation to compare it to. Um, we're going to go into some of the detail as we get along here, 
But just like every good cooking show, we've done a few things off camera just to speed things along. And one of the things we've done is put water sensitive paper all through a target tree. We've picked a tree that's in from the outside edge. And we've done that because of something called a wind effect. If you're looking to calibrate or adjust a sprayer, you want to pick a crop that's a little further in where the wind won't cause any kind of anomalies. In a normal situation, we wouldn't be working in the outside row here, but as I said, it just sort of fit us for the filming. We don't make any changes to the sprayer. We just want to see what you, the operator or the grower, are already doing so that we can see where we can make improvements. So we put water sensitive paper up in the trees, yep. And we have this handy form, which you can download from Sprayers 101. And this is going to guide you through all the information that you need to collect to do this correctly. Where you are, uh, some of the sprayer settings, the nature of the canopy you're spraying, and the weather. And this is an invaluable piece of information. I would normally hold this up and tell you what the wind speed is. There's no wind. It's dead calm. So we're going to get a really good idea what this sprayer can do. But if there was wind, you always want to work on the upwind side it's the hardest thing to do Absolutely. to push into the wind. Yep. So when we set up, this was technically the upwind side, and this is going to be our target tree. Uh, so once you've written down all the information that you need, and you've captured everything on this form, and you've put water sensitive paper in the tree, which we will talk about, we have our intrepid driver who's ready to go. He's gonna have both booms on, he's gonna drive, and he's gonna spray. And then we're gonna go in and just kind of have a look to see how he did. Meanwhile, Don's gonna spin around and park the sprayer to spray the other side because of course we do not want to do alternate row middle spraying we want to spray from every side but if I had Dawn spray both sides and then we looked we'd miss a golden opportunity to see what spraying from one side did for example if there was a wind coming from this direction Dawn would spray into the wind it would halt maybe blow back into the canopy and we can read these water sensitive papers like tea leaves we want to see that then after we've had a look Dawn will spray and we'll see what the cumulative impact is. So let's do that now. Uh, I'm going to flag Don to go ahead and just sort of do his thing. We're going to back up. Um, please, proper PPE. This sprayer has been cleaned. It's been rinsed. When we handle it, we'll use gloves, hearing protection, eye protection from flying debris. Be smart. Be safe. So go ahead, Don, and we'll see what we get. So we got to see what we saw. What do you think about that? Yeah, so absolutely. You know, is more familiar with, with field sprayers, row crop sprayers. Um, I would say we hit a lot, yeah. but we also seem to put a lot of stuff into the air. We did. And, and so I guess that would be my first one is, is hey, that's stuff that's not hitting target. That's, that's money that's essentially going where we don't want it to pollution environmental but also obviously economic right? yeah I think so, you hit so I'm really interested to see how these papers look because my guess is we covered them pretty well but we can probably make things a lot better can't we I don't think I even need to be here let's let's go in and have a look you get to look at our backs for a minute remember warts and all So for those of you who aren't familiar, water sensitive paper, and we will talk more about this on our second pass, are little cards, one by three inch cards typically, that are bright yellow until they're contacted by moisture, whereupon they turn blue. So they're a fantastic instant feedback of where did my spray go, where didn't my spray go. And how you place them is really up to you. But we do use a standard here for any canopy. And that is to put five papers randomly on the outside of the canopy, and then five papers inside the canopy spanning the height. That gives us 10 papers. But I work for the government. I'm cheap, so I fold them. Now we suddenly have two surfaces. And it really doesn't matter how you orient them, as long as when you put them in the tree, you use a little flagging tape or bright ribbon to mark where they were. Because if you're gonna do an iterative process and you wanna replace these cards, it's only fair to put them back in the same place each time and facing the same way. So come on in real close and let's take a look to see what one pass did. Um, I don't think we need to look very hard to discover some very blue cards. 
all through the canopy. And you know, we can part the canopy and it doesn't take a lot. Come on over here for a second. So I'm gonna ask you, Drew, if you came into an orchard or a vineyard or a hop yard or a blueberry operation and saw these papers turn blue, as a grower, I, what would you think? I, I'd be happy. You know, if I was spraying a fungicide where a lot of them, you know, don't have a lot of movement within the canopy, you protect what you hit. I'm saying we hit it, you know, insecticide, anything of the sort. So I would look at that and say, yep, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm still not sure about the amount that went up. And I'm going to bet some went down. Oh, but, yeah. You know, if my job one is to protect, you know, that, that seven, eight foot area of, of green, I, I think the, the paper says that pass did a good job. That's how I would look at it. And, and that's fine. And let's, let's take this opportunity to compare the field grower mentality with the horticultural grower mentality. Uh, in hort, er, sorry, in field crops, maybe we're really interested about productivity and using one less gallon per acre is, you know, so many less refills. Sure, and uh, we really try to skin it. But weirdly on the hort side, the mentality is different. This is a high value crop. Yep. I would much rather use as much water and product as I need to to keep these apples clean or to keep this product viable. I don't really care so much about a bit of extra water. Sure. Both of those attitudes have kind of gone a little too far in each direction. So if your one goal is to provide coverage, you got it. We got it, yep. But we have to consider a lot of other factors. There are really very few products on the market, uh, particularly for Apple, that require that level of coverage. That is an absolute drench. And I'm just gonna pluck one of these out. And I've held these in place with a thumbtack of all things, but you can use any way you want. Take a look at this here. This is runoff. This is what happens when droplets coalesce and just form a drip and fall off. That's wasted product. In fact, and in Atomine, any company that is an agrochemical uh, retailer, they know this is not how these products are tested or supposed to be used. We want a nice, even distribution of product. It's okay to have yellow on here. In fact, for most fungicides and insecticides, 85 drops per square centimeter and 10 to 15% surface coverage is adequate. In fact, it's, it's more than enough. Now, with biorational products or plant growth modifiers, there are, of course, exceptions. And uh, those products that are intended to drench bark, like oils, early season applications, maybe this is okay. But for most of your applications, we just took a bug and killed it and then kept jumping up and down on it over and over and over and over. And as some of my colleagues are, uh, want to say, dead is dead. This is just waste, lost money. So we don't need to go this far. Notice on the other side, since I pulled it out, we've got nothing. That's because this happened to be facing the sprayer. There's very little wind, even though this is the upwind side, and technically it might have blown back, but it's pretty calm. So the only way you're going to hit the back side of a target is to drive the other row. So if you guys are ever out and you have a dyed-in-the-wool alternate row middle sprayer, someone who drives every yes, second row, yes. and then says, I'm going to get back to it, I'm going to get back to it. You may have missed a critical developmental stage where you know, a control product needs to be on before disease yes. takes root, or some developmental stage of an insect where IPM says, go now. You can't go four days later and expect the same job. And you can't expect spray to fly at 100 miles an hour, stop midair, change direction, come back and hit the back of a target. Come on. So you've got to spray from both sides. This has been proven time and time again. And if you're thinking, ah, I get away with it, or I stop when the crop fills in, or I know when to pull out, you're really just dicing. You know, eventually all of these conditions are going to reach a threshold and it's going to bite you. It's just not a good practice. And frankly, most sprayers aren't even designed to do it correctly. That's for another time. So I'm going to put this back, wishing I'd remembered where I got it. Here we go. This is why you use ribbons. And Don is ready to go to spray on the other side. Now we're just going to back out. And Drew, you brought up an excellent point. You saw a lot of spray going over and through the canopy. That's no good. For this to be done correctly, we want enough air to open the canopy, lose its air energy, become turbulent, and deposit the spray. Ideally, you want that to go just beyond the middle of the canopy. You don't want it to come flying out the back end. That's not doing you any good. And 90% of what leaves a canopy ends up in the air or on the ground, notwithstanding the stuff that just blew over the top to begin with. So rather than focus on the sprayer for this second or final half of the pass, 
let's just watch what comes through the canopy. Now, it's not all bad. Lucas, just turn and face the canopies for a second. Perfectly square onto them. Actually, this hole is a great example. Unless you have a sprayer with laser or sonar or some variable rate air blast sprayer, and these are coming in North America, in fact, they're already here, uh, you can't help it. You're going to end up spraying through the hole. So as dawn passes by and you watch how much spray comes through, it's not really all bad. Some of it can't be helped. It's going to come through. What you really want to watch is when it's coming through in the middle of the canopy, then you know you're really overblowing it. So let's head out and let's see what it looks like from uh, the, the second half of the pass. So Don, I think the first thing I would ask, I'm, I'm really hopeful that there's some AC in that little tractor you're in. Indeed there is. Excellent, excellent. So it's quite warm out here. It's important to be comfortable. To That's be right, you. we want the applicator <laughs> to do it right. So we pulled Don in because I want to give you a sense of why this is a two-person job. Don, yes. how did everything look from the cab? It looked fine. So Same as any other spray. could you see anything going over the canopy? No. 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 Could, you, could you see anything going through the canopy? Not from where so I was. you you can't see past the thick canopy. No. Nope. Geez, what good are you? <laughs> All you could see really is I didn't hit anything, and you, just shoulder checks told you that the nozzles that were supposed to be on were on, right? Right. What did we see from our vantage? Well, yeah, we were talking. It would have been nice to have some water sensitive paper on the next row and maybe even the row over. Yeah. There was quite a bit coming through. Yeah, we can do better. We can do better. So come on over and let's take a look at what the cumulative impact of two passes or technically one full pass did. Uh, as we saw previous, we nailed it on that side. We happened to be behind a leaf. This happens. Spraying is highly variable. We're doing one tree in depth here, but there could be an argument for doing more than one plant. Now, in our case, we've laid this out to fit with this protocol, which again, you'll find on Sprayers 101, also in the book Air Blast 101, which I think we'll talk about a little later on. What we're gonna do now is pull the papers from the tree. This is the outer portion of the canopy. So here's our five papers, all folded. And here's the inner portion of the canopy spanning from the bottom to the top. That gives us 20 surfaces to analyze. And because it's so subjective, honestly, all we can say unless you're willing to do the counts, and you can do that, the 85 drops per square centimeter and the 10 to 15% coverage, uh, all we can say is whether it looks too much, okay, or not enough. So let what me just, here? Let's, let's glue this one here. And you hey, can see Dave, we have- Why do you have gloves on? Oh, good point. Uh, Cause I'm a greasy, sweaty person, but you know what, we all are. Water sensitive paper doesn't care what kind of water it is. Sweat, oil, it'll react. So beyond just the safety of handling a sprayer, and the fact that even though we rinsed it, who knows what's in there, we don't want to turn the papers. So you glue, who was stingy with my glue? Give her. Boy golly. It dried out in the time that it took. There we go. I'm gonna blame the weather. Okay. So you wait till the papers are a bit dry, which today, hmm, that's tricky. And you start gluing them in place and you try to keep them in the same order that they were in the tree approximately. And then you can read these like tea leaves. So. There's no reason for you to watch me climb around in this tree and pull them out. We'll stop filming here for a second. We'll populate this table and then we'll see what we get. So let's take a look now. We've collected these papers in approximately the same positions they were in the tree. And just to reiterate, and again, this is any crop, fairly randomly throughout the outside of a canopy and then right up the middle from bottom to top. So there's the bottom, there's the top. Now the way this works is we want to do a count. How many of these surfaces, huh, we're, we're blowing clamps here, it's that hot, we're melting. How many of these surfaces received too much, not enough, or about the right amount? And we can see, you can see here we have excessive, adequate, and inadequate. With 20 surfaces, 80% of them, that is 16 out of 20, have to be excessive or adequate to get the controller to have the biological response we're looking for. We can get away with four of them not being perfectly covered, why? because again, spraying is highly variable. There could be an apple in the way or a leaf or a twig or the wind could take a funny bend. Or perhaps when you put the papers out, one side is pushed against the leaf. 
water-sensitive paper aren't leaves, so they don't blow and move the way leaves do, so we have to give a certain latitude for that. So let's just take a look. Excessive, 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 excessive. Good coverage. Yeah, well, you got the kill, but what a waste. On the other side, and this would be facing into the tree, so this is a little trickier to hit because the spray has to come all the way through the canopy to get to it, this outer surface of the canopy. Uh, I wouldn't say that's good coverage at all. That's an inadequate. Believe it or not, that's adequate. And if you doubt it, just imagine an ascospore landing between the droplets or an insect trying to move between them. It's a, it's a minefield. It's really enough. And if I were to use a loop or a hand lens and we were to zoom in, you'd be amazed at how much more than 85 drops per square centimeter there is there. Uh, excessive, uh, adequate, adequate, that's, that's fine, that's fine. Now we go to the trunk. This spans the entire canopy, and I confess I broke the rules a little bit here. Technically, we really shouldn't count this one as part of our 20 surfaces because I purposely put it way down on the trunk, below the swath of the spray. We don't want to spray the trunk. I could have retired on the money I would have saved growers just going into an operation and turning off the bottom nozzle without even looking to see what the coverage was because spray tends to fall. And if you don't get it on the row you were next to, you're probably going to get it on the next row over. That's just the nature of spray. But convince yourself. Make sure to hang one of the canopy papers at the lowest point of the canopy. And if fruit is making boughs hang low, acknowledge that. But also put one in the trunk. I'm really glad to see we got nothing here because I wasn't aiming for the trunk. So let's focus on these four. Here's the tippy top of the tree. The higher the target, and this is any sprayer, the higher the target, the more likely you are to get bad coverage. Why? Because on a radial sprayer, that's the furthest distance from the top nozzle to the top of your target. And that's a lot of time for spray to decide it doesn't need to go anywhere, thank you very much. Maybe you're not using enough air. If it were a dry day, unlike today, maybe the droplets evaporate before they get there. We really do want to pay a lot of attention to the top of the canopy. So weirdly, even though we were blowing over the top of the tree, we really didn't do a great job up there. Might have been a fluke of paper placement. Perhaps one of the nozzles wasn't quite lined up, but we're going to fix it and keep an eye on it. Just below it, we drenched it. This is fine. This is adequate to almost excessive coverage. This is neat. Uh, this is the side that was facing the sprayer at the time. This was pressed right up against the bark. Nothing's going to push a trunk out of the way. So, you know, you, you really kind of need to learn to read these. But on the whole, this is way too much. And we do have a trouble zone at the top that we need to address. So now we have our base. We put that away. We're going to compare everything we do from now on to what we just did. The first thing we need to do is work with air. Always air. As I mentioned, air is what carries the spray into the tree, fights environmental wind, helps with what's called transfer efficiency. That's getting the droplet from the nozzle to the target. It opens up the canopy to allow spray to penetrate. And if you get it right, and the air runs out of air energy when it gets to the crop, the leaves will start to waffle and expose all surfaces, which means more opportunity for spray to land all over those surfaces. So the first thing we need to do is park the sprayer right in front of the canopy we're aiming for, and we're going to tie ribbons all along the air outlet. Why would we do such a thing? Because when we turn the, spray, the, the air on, not the spray, you're going to see those ribbons straighten out. And we can extrapolate, and it gives us an idea. Do we need to move deflectors on our radial sprayer? Do we need to move the towers on a non-fixed tower like this sprayer is? In other words, is the air actually lining up with the canopy? Now bear in mind this can get a little tricky. If you're on uneven ground and you're using a tower, it may tend to do this, rock and roll as you drive. So you'd like the air to be slightly higher than the canopy at all times, always. That's the deflector on a radial sprayer, or that's the towers. We need to acknowledge the fact that there's not so much wind down here, but the higher you get off the ground, wind gets faster and we need to compete with it. So it's okay to overshoot the canopy a bit. We don't want to blow it straight up into the air, but it is okay to overshoot it. So that's what we're going to do now, is park the sprayer here, tie the ribbons, and get Dawn to turn on the air, and we're going to see what we see with lining it up. Let's do that now. Now part one of air adjustment, no matter your sprayer, is to determine if you're spanning the entire canopy. As I said earlier, we want it to just go over the top and just go under the bottom. This particular sprayer is a, a non-fixed tower. It's a, it's a flexible tower. We can adjust the angles. 
Uh, you might be using a radial sprayer, which is like this. If you don't have deflector plates on the tops and bot bottoms, you get them, get them, get them. And they should look like this in cross section because we want to channel the air. We, have, we want to be able to compress and aim it. So as I said, it's just under and just over the canopy. So we park the sprayer, we have the operator turn on the air, and we assess using ribbons how it's lined up. We're going to do that now. Eye protection and ear protection. So what we saw was that these towers happened to be set scissored. Very few sprayers can do this, but this one can. And they were probably set this way for a taller crop. This isn't a taller crop. So we're wasting a lot of our air energy over the top, and you could see from the bottom ribbon and the way the tree behaved that we were really only engaging the canopy about here. And as I mentioned, droplets on their own, even though we have pressure behind them, don't tend to go very far. They need air assist. So Don, come on back here. Uh, this particular sprayer has clamps, banding clamps around the outside. So we loosen these and we can adjust the air to match the canopy, then we tighten them back up. And for anyone that actually owns a turbo mist, please never lubricate these bands as you drive and they bump along, or here where we are in this region where there's sand, it acts like ball bearings, and they slowly kind of move on their own accord while you're driving. So while it's okay to loosen up the nut and lube that up, don't, don't do anything with the bands. So can you help me loosen that up? And we're just going to shift these straight up and down. How convenient that you had a wrench. We're doing the, we'll do this one first. Whichever you like. A little more? I can measure that. It doesn't look quite up and down. Or vertical. Oh, wow. Now there, one more use for a cell phone. A digital plum. That looks pretty good. Maybe back a bit. That's zero right there. I'll take your word for it. You're the digital guy. Now while Don's doing this, uh, because he works a lot harder than I do, do you have to do this for every single crop? Well, that's up to you. Ideally, yes. Now, I don't expect anyone to get out of the sprayer, move the towers, adjust the nozzles, change the air, particularly in, in highly variable crops. There just isn't enough time, but there are strategies. If you have multiple sprayers, maybe some of them are aligned and set up for certain crops. Uh, perhaps the order that you're spraying could be reconsidered so that any of the canopies of a certain height or a density get one setup, and then you go back and make one change and spray those that are of a moderate size, then you make another change and spray the really small ones. There's always a solution, but it really depends on how good a job you want to do and how much time you're willing to put into it. That wasn't too bad. Some of these things really stick. Nice. Perfectionist. I told you we'd do this in real time. You'll get a sense of how long this actually takes. So let's combine a couple of steps. Now we've aligned the air, or if we were on a radial sprayer, we've adjusted our deflectors. That's all well and good, except that sprayer's parked. The way air works is it takes time to get from the source into the target. And this is where we do two things at once. We determine how hard this thing is blowing, and we talk about travel speed. You may not think travel speed has anything to do with air penetration, but in fact it can make or break it. Everybody uses travel speed as a tool for productivity. Must drive as fast as possible. Uh, there's a certain truth to that. Of course, we do need to get things done. But the faster you drive, the less time air has to push other air out of the way, shove the canopy out of the way, and then run out of energy. It's called dwell time. If I were to park and just blow, we would create a current, just like behind a boat. If I drove really fast, spraying just as hard, the air would just kind of scuff the outside. So we can use travel speed as a way to adjust how far we penetrate a canopy. We have other tools. What's your PTO set at? What's your RPMs? Normally. Normally. 330. What do they happen to be today? It's, it's almost as if we set this up to be as bad as possible so we could fix things. Of course, we would never do that. 
Dawn's at 540 RPMs. If you're using a centrifugal pump, that may be where you have to live. Because if you back your RPMs off, the, uh, the pressure and the flow from a centrifugal pump just drops right off and you'll have a dribble. So you can't really mess with your PTO speed. But fortunately, we have a positive displacement pump on this one, as you should, not that I have a bias. And that gives Don another tool called Gear Up, Throttle Down. He can gear the sprayer up, throttle back, and drop his RPMs to spin the fan slower. The nice thing about positive displacement pumps is they tend to have enough capacity that even if you slow them down, we just make a little twist on the regulator and we can maintain our pressure. All that to say, I can divorce the flow from the nozzles from how much air is being produced. We still have another tool. Is this geared? Do we have a fan gear? Yes, a high and low. We're high and low. Let me guess. Are we in high right now? Again, it's like we set this up. We're going to put this thing in low gear. There's a little trick to that sometimes if you can't get your gear to move. Uh, just give your fan a little twist until the teeth line up and you can pop it into low gear. So where I did say this was an iterative process and we want to make one change at a time and see what it does, I also recognize that you're all getting a little bored right now. So we're going to do a few things at once. We are going to gear up and throttle down to drop our RPMs and slow the fan. And we're going to drop into low gear. And how fast were you driving? Actually, that's really good. About five kilometers an hour is a good starting point. We're not gonna mess with Don's speed. So can we make that change to the gear? And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a drive-by and look for what? How do we know if we did it? We have another tool. And again, it's just as cheap as using ribbon. While Don's making those changes, we're gonna go around to the upwind and far side of the tree and attach three I don't know, 50 centimeter long ribbons, actually considerably less, 20 centimeter long. And we're gonna put them on the far side. So when Don drives by blowing, we're gonna watch those ribbons. If the ribbon stands straight out into the wind, we're blowing too hard. If it hangs limp and doesn't move, possibly we're not blowing hard enough. And I say possibly because if you're in a really wide, dense canopy, maybe the air wasn't sufficient to push out to the far end. That'd actually be pretty darn good. That means everything gets left in the canopy. But on a narrow tree like this, we do expect to see it move a little bit. But again, just like the spring, the one we really want to see move is the one at the tippy top. If it just wafts as you blow by, that means you're getting just enough air there. So again, Don will make these changes. We'll go around and clip or tie a few lengths of ribbon onto the far side. Then we'll do a drive by and see what we see. What did you think of that? So they moved. Yep. They sure didn't go straight out. Nope. Um, but one of the things we have noticed is that, you know, we've been working at this about 40, 45 minutes. There's actually a, some, some, some wind now. I wouldn't call it windy, but it's picked up. So, so how does that factor in as well? You know, we're trying to calibrate while well, conditions are changing. Like right. It makes it quite challenging. Great points. I mean, this is reality. Um, recognize that you're always trying to set the sprayer up for a bit of a worst case scenario. You don't want to cut yourself to the quick. We do not want this application to fail. So I would always err on them standing out a bit more than not moving. And you know your conditions. You know your orchard. We know around this time of the day, typically, which direction the wind's coming from. So we kind of anticipated this. Uh, as I mentioned, it's not such a big deal for this one to move. And it's really nice when this one moves. But that's the one we've got to watch. So, you know, do whatever you have to do to get that to move. And if it only just moves, Give it a bit more air. Don't, don't cut yourself to the quick. So what we just saw was good. You know, we, we've got a good travel speed now, so we don't change that. We've got the air arranged nicely to span the canopy. We don't change that. We don't change our RPMs. We don't change our fan gear. That is all a lock. It's funny that when you're optimizing a sprayer, the last thing you do is actually talk about the spraying part. But remember, wherever the air goes, the spray goes. One other last little thing while I'm thinking about it, the ribbons are a fantastic indicator for whether you need more or less air. They are also a great indicator for when the wind changes and uh-oh, I'm not doing what I want it to do. Maybe I have to make a change on the fly. Don't ever be afraid to change your regulator, change your RPMs, change your speed in the middle of an application. Your number one objective is to get good coverage, not to hold everything just so. And I know that may fly into the face of some pesticide rate questions that I'm sure are gonna come up, 
but our objective is to get good coverage and not waste a lot of products, so don't be afraid to make those changes. Watch the leaves too. I've seen conditions where oddly the ribbons don't move a ton, but you can see the leaves doing this. I can't explain it. Maybe it's just a weird fluke of turbulence. But watching the leaves and watching the ribbons together is a good way to go. So now that we have all the air set up, let's talk nozzles. Uh, I did mention perhaps that is a turbo mist sprayer. Every nozzle on that outlet is on at the moment. I know because I checked. It's actually not how they're supposed to be set up. On a turbo mist, every second nozzle is supposed to be engaged. That's so you can carry a dilute and to concentrate without having to get out and mess with your nozzles. Every other nozzle. Every other right. nozzle. A, B, A, B, A, B. So right. you spray with the A's or you spray with the B's. Every sprayer is different. If you're using uh, something that has rollover nozzle bodies, they're typically all supposed to be engaged and your high and low volume or your dilute concentrate can be flipping A to B, A to B, A to B. But we can also change rates. And let's go look at a, a catalog to see how nozzles are rated. And then let's consider what we're gonna do with the nozzles to get good coverage. Okay, let's stop there and go around to the other side. We've already had a kind of a hint about which nozzles need to be on or off. And that's thanks to these original ribbons. When we adjusted how the outlet was in relation to the canopy, we started to get some sense of where each nozzle was, was aimed. Now, as I mentioned, in this case, every single nozzle happened to be on. That's really not what the sprayer is intended to do. So we've gone ahead and shut off every second one. In the case of a... Uh, a radial sprayer with rollover bodies, uh, you could flip to a nozzle with a different rate or even just turn them off entirely. So how do you know how much flow to use? This goes back to that whole iterative process. Um, if you get too much coverage in a certain spot, you have to recognize that one nozzle's job is to cover a certain portion of the canopy. So anything that interpolates with that or lines up with that paper, that's kind of the culprit you need to work with. If you don't see enough, go to a higher flow. If you uh, do see too much, maybe you need less flow. Sometimes, as I say, it's as easy as turning off nozzles, but sometimes it gets a little more complicated and you have to go to something like a T-Jet or an Al Buz catalog and use their tables to work out what pressure uh, creates. Here's your pressure up here and here's your flow in gallons per minute. They're also metric. And then you figure out which nozzle at which pressure puts out how much flow. So, I don't expect you to have a whole bunch of these, expect, these expensive poly nozzles on hand, but I do love these ceramic centered poly nozzles. And I like them because they're single piece and they're color coded for rate. Uh, I actually prefer the TXs, which are a bit stubby or don't catch on too much. And Albus has its own ATRs, I think, possibly, uh, equivalent in that line. But you can also get disc core, cheap old brass disc and core nozzles which to my mind only have one decent use, and that's to play with rates. We started out by saying, where are you getting your spraying advice? On a field sprayer, every nozzle is the same rate and generally the same shape. You may orient them slightly differently, but for the most part, it's the same tip. We don't have to go by those rules. If you have a whole lot of canopy here and very little up there, you can go with higher flow in this area and less flow in this other area. Now, this happens to be a, a pretty uniform depth canopy, and because we're using a tower, it's a uniform distance to target. So, typically, we don't mess around with changing rates on this. Every nozzle is the same distance from the same amount of canopy, so we, we can, it's easier. The only difference is, at the very top, I, I like to use air induction nozzles. Why? They make bigger droplets, and that means if they miss the top of the canopy, they tend to fall right back into the orchard or the whatever you're growing, that operation again without drifting away. That's where a lot of the drift in an operation comes from. It's not generally here, it's up there. So that's the only place where we really need uh, air induction nozzles. So we've shut them all off. Uh, sorry, we've shut every second one off. We're going to assume we have the right flow rate. If you don't like the flow, as I say, mess around with the disc and core. And then when you like the rate that you've found, look up how much flow is coming out, and then you can invest in the more expensive tip. So when we started all this to develop our base, I already had the water sensitive paper in the tree. That was just to save time. But I will show you now uh, how that works. So you get 50 water sensitive papers in a packet. These are one by three inch. Um, welcome to Canada. We tend to bounce back and forth between imperial and metric. You're going to place five randomly in the exterior of the canopy. I pre-folded these and I've done it with gloves so that I didn't mar them. It just makes it quick and easy when you're putting them up. If you want to get really picky, you can even write on the back so you can figure out where they came from. Uh, I also like to use, where's our target tree? It's here somewhere. 
down there, we're a little further ahead. Let's move down a little bit. In our target tree, I've gone ahead and I've marked the places with these fluorescent ribbons. I use this tool a lot, dirt cheap. Uh, we've marked the places with these fluorescent ribbons, so we put the papers back where we found them. Again, it makes it a fair comparison. So we simply take a paper out of the bag with our nice dry, dry non-sweaty hands, we hope. And there it is with the pin right through it. You can use alligator clips, you can do anything you want. And I'm just gonna go right here to where I have one and just push it right into the stem. You now you wouldn't think that would stay put, but they do, it's amazing. I learned this trick in Australia. I used to use clips all the time, but I, I prefer this method, it's faster and easier. So you'll put, the, uh, you'll put the five random throughout the exterior of the canopy, and then with the help of a ladder, uh, you put them along the trunk all the way to the top. And maybe you're saying, hey, I grow hops, there's no trunk, and I'm not interested in a 20-foot ladder. I get that. One of the tricks is to use uh, aluminum or galvanized conduit. And what you do is you uh, tape alligator clips or something to the exterior, and then you put it in there, and then you push it up through the center of the tree, and then you snap the next layer on, and the next layer, and the next layer, and boom, you've spanned a 20-foot canopy with water-sensitive paper. And then you just take it down in reverse. Be creative, there are lots of ways to do this. So I'm just gonna keep papering this tree, there's no need to keep you around for that. Then we're gonna do a drive-by with the air aligned correctly, the right air energy or volume of air, the correct travel speed, and I hope a much better flow distribution. Will we still see drenches? We might. And that might mean we need different nozzles. I don't tend to push people to change pressure to get different rates. It's good for minor adjustments. But if we have excessive flow still in some of these positions, you will need a different tip. So we'll see what we end up with. All right, we'll let that settle a little bit. Let's go in and see what we can see. Once again, we like to take a look before we've done both passes just to get a, a halfway mark sense of it. You know, it's funny, you never know what to expect. And we're doing this live. There's, there are no tricks here. You see what you see. So that's still drenched, but I never get bent out of shape over the top one. I didn't see a lot of excessive no, spray over the top. We did say that's a typically a trouble zone in, in tall targets. So I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, if you come in a little closer, take a look here. See that nice, even distribution? There's, there's no drip points. There's no real misses. Uh, we're well in excess of 15% coverage and well in excess of 85 drops per square centimeter. You'll have to trust me on that. But there are apps like SnapCard or some uh, citizen scientist kind of systems like DropScope where you can scan these in. But the use of a, a linen tester, which is just a little magnifying glass or a hand loop, you can count very quickly how many drops are that. And you're going to see real quick it's more than 85. Now, you come on over here. Again, it's, it's kind of excessive, but you can begin to see shadows where the leaves covered up, and certainly you can see the shadow where the pin held it in place. We ignore those. What's wild is sometimes you get these. So that's insufficient. We, we don't want to see that. Now, we haven't sprayed from the other side yet, and yet there's some wraparound. Why is that? Because we didn't blow clean through the tree. We blew, and it ran out of air energy, and those fine droplets got carried around in that roller coaster ride and ended up on the back. So I'm going to put that back. That's not an emergency yet because we still have to spray from the other side and we may hit that yet. It just goes to show why we want to spray from both sides. Let's keep looking. We will of course pull all these out and put them on the chart. This one, not bad, right on the edge of adequate. That doesn't give me any warm fuzzies so we may need a little more flow in that position. Strange that it's only just what, six, eight inches above the other one and fairly open? Just the variability of spraying. This one's lovely. That's fantastic. 
What do you think of that, Drew? Like, yeah, you... I was going to say, if you were a bug, you'd be hard pressed to uh, to escape getting hit with the an insecticide product. That's a bad day for a bug. Absolutely. I agree. Could take that, Mullen. So let's stop there. We'll let uh, Dawn do the second pass, and this time we're going to keep the camera in this row because something we didn't get a chance to show you, and we will, is that while there's still some spray blowing through, and that's unavoidable, and I suspect a lot of what we're seeing are these gaps in the canopy. It's nowhere near as colossal as it was before. And we still have enough air that it's robust enough to answer your question earlier that if there are minor changes in wind, you can kind of handle that. So let's get them to spray the other half, and then we'll pull all these out, put them on the chart, and see what we see. Have a little outro for our video, and we're done. Okay, we've recovered all the papers from the tree. Again, this is, you know, we're doing this sort of live before a studio audience. We didn't know what we were going to see. And we didn't do a whole lot with the rates, except that we recognized that we had too much and turned every second one off. So let's interpret these tea leaves with our rapidly melting at 40 degrees Celsius with humidity, by the way. This is how much we care today. Let's compare how we did. Here is the outside of the canopy. And, you know, we don't have, this one is inadequate. I'll go ahead and say that. But the rest of them... Yeah, good luck. You're a mullen bug or an ascospore or something. As long as you have the product on in time, and we know for protecting products, we have to get there ahead of time. We've had a lot of rain recently. None of this would have stuck around. We would have to reapply. No residual is going to tolerate 50 millimeters in less than 24 hours. But all things being equal, if this went on and dried, this is a fantastic amount of coverage. Now, Drew, you pointed out earlier what happens when conditions change. If the wind had picked up excessively, we wouldn't see this. Would have been a completely different pattern. It would have been. And, and you know, you're going to need to learn in your operation what happens when the wind changes. That's why you got to get out real quick and just tack one of these up. It only takes a second. Every time you do it, you learn more about your environment, your crop, and your sprayer. Um, so I'm going to say one of these is inadequate, and the other 9 out of 10 are adequate or even excessive. But if the crop grew a little bit or the wind picked up, you know, don't, don't risk your operation. We're not trying to skin you here. Along the trunk itself, this is the depth of the tree, these are a little harder to hit because it's, it's as far away from the sprayer as you can get. And quite often I pin these right against the trunk, which meant their back end was covered up by a lot of bark. Nevertheless, I, I mean, if you could get in really close and see this the way we can see this, there are no misses. There are a few here that would definitely give me some pause. But if our, if our rule is 80% covered, uh, adequate or excessive, we're there. Now, if I had a little more time, Perhaps I'd fine tune this a bit. I might see a little more flow at the bottom of the sprayer. I would go up to the next nozzle size. I'm really happy with what we're seeing at the top of the tree. It is too much, yes. But as I mentioned, that's typically the trouble zone where the winds are highest and the target is furthest. So I don't mind excessive coverage up there. Um, all things considered, this sprayer is now adjusted for the environment, for the tree, etc. Have we calibrated? I haven't done any math. I don't actually know how much spray came out. I don't even know how fast we were driving. This is the part where you do your sprayer math. Use the GPS on your phone if you don't have a reliable speedometer, and quite often they're not. Uh, thankfully, Apple's got us covered. Uh, when it comes to pressure, pressure drop is really only a concern when you're a low pressure applicator at the highest point, so those would be air shear type systems. Generally isn't a problem for other air blast sprayers. Nevertheless, good to have a check and see what your pressure is at the nozzle versus at the pump. Do go through your nozzles with something like the spot-on SC4 and a length of hose to collect flow at a given pressure to make sure your nozzles are in fact doing what you think they're doing. That's calibration. Get all that done. And finally, you figure out your rates. How much liquid am I spraying per acre or per hectare on this row spacing? It might surprise you to discover how little you need. Um, we're not going to go a whole lot down this road because it's a more advanced discussion, but there... Maybe, Jason, I could jump in. Oh, sure. Say, I bet you a bunch of that math is going to be in your Sprayers 101 booklet for those that signed up and are able to join in. We'll be getting a copy, but I've read through it, and as a guy that likes to do math, the, the, the math is all there, easy to follow. So, yeah, again, maybe saving some time and some heat. I appreciate so that. Yeah, it, in there. just read the book. It's all in the book. And, and of course, the book is free on Sprayers101.com. But one of the important things here is to talk to the guy that actually has to do the work. I get to go home at the end of you know, one of these jobs. You have to live with it. You've been through this process, and before we actually film this, what do you think of it? Well, I think it's great. I, we started with uh, ceramic cone and disc nozzles. We were, uh, turns out in hindsight, we were basically fire hosing Niagara Falls out here. Shark fin up top, the whole bit. You can see where I was spraying. 
Uh, Jason went through, we did all this a few times, uh, re-nozzled the sprayer, got everything calibrated. I'm spraying a much larger area on the same tank, uh, which saves time and money. And it's disease important. pressure, insect pressure? Uh, the efficiency has increased since we are applying less volume, getting better results. That's great. And, and that's we're, how we're it should go. targets versus just drenching the field. That's great. The Why bother spraying the grass in the yeah. sky, right? Yeah. Well, that's it from us. Uh, I think maybe Drew has a few things he'd like to say as we, as we finish up and I go quietly melt over there. Yeah, well, I think all I can really say is, is thank you very much, Don, and, and you know all the work that probably was required on behalf of the station, but I think you guys always keep it looking this, this tidy and tight. Uh, this, for me, as I said, you know, I've got a lot of background knowledge in, in row crop. This was, it was awesome. I think the term calibration, we probably used the wrong term. I think optimization is, is more what we did here. But yeah, you know, to me, the, the takeaway was, was probably just cheap and cheerful. Get a little bit of that flag tape. You know, you could see that when you were spraying. So if you could put some of that up in the canopy, that would tell you what the wind's doing if the, you know, the leaves aren't reading as well. Um, it looks like, you know, you can make things a lot better quite simply. And, and I think in the world of, of horticulture and, and orchards is, you know, you're gonna be coming back in time after time after time. So why not do it right every time and, and you know, Boy, because this is a high value crop, let's let's make sure we optimize that value. So you brought up a good point. The the flagging tape, it's not just for the optimization. I just leave it up there. I mean eventually it's gonna photo oxidize and get brittle and break down. Leave it there. Occasionally have a partner go to the far side and see if you're still getting through. It's yep. a great hint. Maybe the canopy's grown up and it's time to make a change. Also, if you've got neighbors downwind, it's a great visual check to say yeah i'm not so concerned about drift because the wind's not blowing that way and i'm using air induction at the top and adam kind of ran with this didn't you guys get flagging yeah, we, tape we did you know we we, uh, we don't have it in our hot little hands yet but the printing press is, is running and, and we will get rolls of, of that high vis flagging tape with with our symbol because i think that's just a great way to say hey let's help you optimize it but even from an environmental perspective let's get what we want where we want it and nowhere else because you know, in this regulatory world, when, when you start going off target, people start looking. So absolutely. We don't want to lose our products. Keep our pro yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Don, for taking the time here. Thanks to Adama for making this happen. Go to sprayers101.com.